You're listening to a LTA Sex Podcast. LTA Sex. Sex positively. Welcome to Behind Closed Doors, the podcast where we talk about sex, relationships, and life completely unedited. I'm your host, Jerome Stewart Nichols, writer, sex and relationship coach, and creator of sexual lifestyle blog, LTASex.com. If you know me, you know I love talking about sex basically all the time. Uh, Behind Closed Doors is your chance to get a bit more raw and personal with me than ever before. Most often, I'll be talking to my partner and submissive bubby, but you'll hear me musing by myself or sitting in a room with any random person from time to time. Behind Closed Doors definitely isn't your average sex podcast, but it's not about the size. All that matters is how deep and arousing the conversation is. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe and tell your friends about it. You should also consider giving the show a review on iTunes. Make sure to check out LTASex.com for more from me. You can find more info on Behind Closed Doors at LTASex.com slash Behind Closed Doors. If you're one of those people using social media, you can also find me, LTASex, or Behind Closed Doors on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, SoundCloud, uh, all of that shit. Alright, enough of me talking about this bullshit. Let's get to the sex. Oh, and so it's a basically it's a excuse to engage in my own compulsive furniture hoarding but to <laughs> say it's for work and to deduct it on my taxes oh that's wonderful that's, that's i would say my entire career in professional sm is just like a ruse for me to be able to just buy really luxurious gear and be like i have to because this is my job <laughs> um so I have this like stunning bondage chair that I had made. It was a saga. I had this chair made in the UK. It was like, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark style crated up in this giant box and then sent on a ship that went like through the Panama Canal. And so that's arrived. And it's kind of like the Lexus of bondage chairs. So this is the thing that I'm just like, no ass, no bare ass on the leather of this chair ever. And then I also like a day later got this set of um, pony stocks that I'm really stoked about. I've got to be honest. I think I might be a little jealous of you in your collection. Come <laughs> over. <laughs> this is, I, I, you know, I set these things up for sharing. Come to San Francisco. I'd love to host you. Oh my God. That'd be so much fun. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No, seriously. Like bring, bring your boy, like, you know, bring, bring something to play with. Cause <laughs> otherwise oh, we're going to San Francisco. I, he's seriously. Behind me on the bed. Oh, very nice. I know. I know. I always joke that this is why submissives are so valuable. Because my intense gear fetishism only makes sense if I've got someone to put in it. Exactly. Um, if you've got someone that you can, you know, restrain or punish. Yeah. Yeah. Like, otherwise, I'm just a grown-ass woman being kind of itchy and bored by myself. <laughs> no <laughs> one no. That's not particularly sexy. It's not, though. It's not. I often say, like, if I take a, an extended trip where there's, like, not going to be SM or the level of SM I'm used to doing, I'm cranky by the end of it. Like, I, I need some, I get to play much more than the average bear. I, I need to be able to make all that happen. <laughs> what What is your favorite kind of play? Or, like, favorite furniture, favorite? Uh, it's so hard. So, you know, my space is, I like to joke I have the, the least effective use of San Francisco real estate ever right now, because I have a dedicated 1500 square foot, five room Victorian flat that no one lives in. That is just my dedicated play space Ooh. in a town where that thing would rent for $9,500 a month. <laughs> but I, I think being a landlord is like a pretty, you know, evil endeavor and I have no desire to make a living, you know, providing a basic human need like housing, I have, I have strong feelings about this. So it's like, no, of course I'm gonna like utilize this space for for a dungeon. Um, course, but I mean, then the other, match, space. yeah. But and then that, then the other really inefficient thing I do is that I my fetishes live on kind of diametrically opposed ends of the spectrum. So half of the space is very traditional leather dungeon and I have the things that I love doing there. And then half of the space is very traditional domestic discipline, age regression, ABDL, um, you know, kind of feminization, this like soft pink hardwoods, floral, you know, draperies, just very, it doesn't, you know, it's sinister, but it doesn't look that way at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I have an entirely another group of things I love doing there. Um, but but I you know, that's, sort of, that's sort of like, 
a, a truth, I guess, for like a lot of people who do BDSM because it's like, you know, I'm a very kind, caring, sweet person and I take care of my puppy, but sometimes I just need to like beat him. Right. <laughs> right. I think this is it, right? Like on one on the one hand, I'm a really compersive player. So, you know, what I like to do is often keyed into what my submissive is really good at. And um and that like relational quality is what's so great about kink. But then also I'm a big fat sadist. And there are gonna be times when if we're just going with what would make me happy, that's gonna be being able to just like really lay into someone, you know, in a you know, graceful, intentional way, but still. Yeah, but still heavy. lay into them. But still lay into them, yeah. Yeah. So so I know that like I'm a huge bondage fetishist. I love aesthetic bondage. I love inescapable immobilizing bondage. Kind of goes along with the gear fetish. Um, you know, I love I love rope. I love rope suspension and like all the kind of like really pretty. I'm, my style of rope that I was kind of trained and taught up in was um, my my rope mentor was Lou Duff, this amazing butch dyke in San Francisco, and she did this thing that was kind of like Seventh Avenue rope. It was kind of like a New York in a, a New York shibari hybrid. <laughs> um, and so I, I think that that informs a lot of like the rope I love to do, but then I also you know love leather. I go through these phases of being like super into metal bondage. Um, I have all this puppy stuff right now. I have a renter who's really like, you know, looking to have a kind of ongoing equestrian relationship. So I've been trying to stalk more like pony things, which of course is really making me want to do pony play. <laughs> So, of course, if you have it around, why not use it? Right, but it's um, yeah, it's it's yeah, that's that's one of the great like luxuries of actually having a dedicated space where you don't have to hide your toys in a box under the bed or keep things in the closet. Is it you can really just be like, nope, the room is going to be there to inspire me and do a whole bunch of stuff for me. I honestly, even in my house, I just have like sex toys sitting on the shelf, and yeah. if you over and you happen to see sex toys, you're probably just going to be, um, wow, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I would imagine too, right? Like you are this like, you know, out integrated, holistic, like sex educator, coach, like blogger, like this is, this is your, this is like your livelihood in addition to, you know, being kind of like sex positive lifestyle. Right. Um, and so I do think there's something, right? Like one would hope folks would say like, yeah, of course Jerome's going to have some pretty like awesome stuff on the bookcase <laughs> that might not be books. Um, I think that's, there's something really rare and wonderful and I never um, stop being grateful for what it means to get to be that out and that integrated. Um, although I will say I adopted uh, my second Chihuahua last fall and they because we were my partner and I were in New Mexico where they're from and we like you know there's like a, a lot of chihuahuas in New Mexico we like fell in love with this tiny dog who we wanted to like you know get from the rescue agency and bring with us to San Francisco they put us through it was like we were adopting a child like they they sent out a representative from like a Labrador rescue, which I'm not sure where the connection is, to come and, and interview the house. And as they're interviewing us and like making sure we're not ax murderers and can care for this like, you know, four and a half pound teacup chihuahua, I'm realizing that I clean the house, but I have like no, you know, scanner for like how many blindfolds are out. And that, you know, like there was a five foot dressage whip leaning against the front door and it's, as and so like as i'm talking to this person like these little objects are appearing in my peripheral vision i'm like please don't turn around and see the blindfold please don't turn around and see the blindfold <laughs> you know i wish i honestly like i feel like that shouldn't be a thing that would disqualify you but of course it will Right. Well, and you know, this is my kind of funny story about a Chihuahua, um, you know, where it really gets into serious issues, I think, for people's lives is around things like child custody. Um, and we know that like kink participation, um, non-monogamy participation has absolutely been used in courts to deprive people of parental rights. So that's really serious stuff. That, yeah. That's stuff that can change people's lives and change kids' lives. And I... Hugely. Um, one of my friends actually recently just adopted uh, her niece. Uh, her sister or cousin was going into uh, some like personal issues, mm -hmm. so she ended up adopting her niece. Uh, and that 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 whole thing was incredibly stressful. Yeah. Um, I, 
I wouldn't have thought that there was anything like super objectionable about the way that they lived before, uh, you know, that she came to live with them. But they, they had to do so much stuff mm. in order to, you know, get Asia with them in, in a house where people care about them. And I'm just like, what if, you know, they had a little less money and couldn't make all these changes? Where would she be? Right? Yeah, no, it's, I think about this, I think in queer communities, you know, like where parenting is so intentional um, and there's a strong overlap with like adoptive parents, adoptive, you know, families that are kind of like bringing children in by choice, that the the intentionality and the things, the tests you have to pass to be able to go through that process are staggering. Um, in the way that you know, my partner will often say, like, if, um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll know folks that are in, um, you know, kind of like cis relationships where procreation is possible, and they'll talk about how they're trying to get pregnant, and we're like, you're not trying to get pregnant, you're having unprotected sex. Trying to get pregnant is when you're trying to have a kid is when you go through like you know the two and a half year legal ordeal of you know of trying to foster or adopt someone. Like that's there's some like mad effort in that. Um, have you, have you ever like considered having kids with your lifestyle? No, you know, I've, I, from a very early age knew that I wasn't interested in having kids. Um, it's nice to be in a generational moment where that kind of childless by choice is a thing. Um, and it's interesting working with as many couples as I do. You know, like I'm really mommy identified in my SM. I do a huge amount of like age regression and ABDL play. I know a lot of that play is really preserved for me because I'm not actually um, raising children. I haven't raised children. And, you know, I'm, I'm 40, you know, almost 42 um, in a couple of three weeks. And, and that's clearly like I'm at a point where that, that ship feels like it increasingly each year it sails by <laughs> even farther. Um, and it works really well for me, right? Like I'm, I'm chihuahuas, not kids. We, my partner and I like to joke that maybe in like another 10 or 15 years, we would go through the process of like fostering or raising a sort of older, you know, probably queer slash gender nonconforming, um, person who was looking for family to just kind of like help establish them through their late adolescence. Yeah. Um, like that's always, but I think that's what queer communities do in general. Like I've, huge extended family of choice um and there's lots of children in my life and so i get to be an auntie and you know and participate in that way and that that works really well for me you know i when it comes to uh parenthood the possibility i'm only 27 but it, it's still a thought that i have periodically I've, i mm -hmm. i will say that i do really like the idea of later in my life once things are more settled um, going back and adopting uh, kids who are quote unquote undesirable. Yeah. Um, I even if it was just like older teenagers or uh, people with special uh, special needs or of course queer children because you know they're they're not it's not like they're being well taken care of or well desired in the uh, mm -hmm. adoption system I, anyway. And I, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that 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 we both had a, had a similar idea about the things we wanted to do. It's like, I wonder if there's some sort of, I don't know, the, the psychology behind uh, the, the kinky sex that we like to have, the dom-sub, the sadism. It, it, I always wonder if it really comes from a place that's more kind than people like to think. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I know I... I could definitely say that desire to raise something or take care of something or be the kind of provider and protector of something, those needs are all met by my kink. Um, and maybe if I didn't have my kink, I would feel more drawn to having kids. Isn't that funny? I mean, in this like totally different way, right? Like clearly one is a sort of like erotic sensual en enterprise. The other is absolutely not. But like on a caretaking level, on that level that's about like connection and relatedness. Um, yeah, like my, my dominance, it comes from this like deeply nurturing place. Um, I think sometimes much, I, mean, I don't know if you get this, much to the disappointment <laughs> of some submissives whose fantasies are really keyed in toward being just kind of like ravaged and used 
and the kindness can actually be a bit of a turn off. Um, I haven't reached that, but I, I know with my guy, he he likes that that we do both. Yeah. That I'm well, and when you're being mean, it's always knowing that it's within this larger context that he knows you care for him, you're kind, you're taking care of him, right? right. So that is the structure. That's the container that allows you to then every once in a while really just like get into like super, super mean, mean, mean top mode or however that might look for you. I, how it looks for me is kind of um, changing in the short time that I've been experiencing it. It's, it's become a, um, it went from this like full on hyper focus. um, I am in this and this is the only thing I'm thinking about sort of thing. Mm -hmm. a much more conscious uh, uh, dynamic, I guess I I would say, um, experience. Mm -hmm. And I've been sort of, uh, for for me, I've been sort of trying to figure out how that works because this is my first time uh, doing this in in any like regular sense. I've, I've played around in the past before I met him, but I wasn't I never identified as particularly kinky. Um, but then being in a uh, full-time DS relationship from not being kinky is a big <laughs> shift. Um, yeah. One that I have liked a lot, but it's still very new. And I'm still trying to figure out all the um, ins and outs of how my brain and my body and my sexuality are working now. Right. Well, and it's a, pro- it's a work in progress, right? Like the, I think you're describing this like really appropriate kind of process by which we all tend to, you know, find something new, want to delve really, really deeply into it. Sometimes go through those like early stages of just like, this is all day, all the time. And then, you know, kind of reach a, a sort of homeostasis where we might be um, able to experience that kink desire wax and wane a little bit. Um, and I do often like to say that like managing kink and particularly DNS dynamics in your relationship, is kind of like learning how to drive a stick shift, you know, in San Francisco, <laughs> right? Like you're going to parallel park on a, you know, 90 degree hill <laughs> with a, with a manual transmission. And that's how you're going to learn how to drive. Like it's a really advanced set of skills. Um, but then when you're done getting those, like if, if when you get those skills down, I think they transfer to the more kind of vanilla or, um, you know, statistically frequent style of um, of being related really, really beautifully. I, I would agree with that. I definitely have uh, found myself being able to love him better mm. and love people in general better through the lessons I've learned in through kink. Yeah. And for me, it's been a very fulfilling experience, I will say. Mm. Uh, Cause I, I never, like I, I said before, I never really thought of myself as being kinky. It, it just, so, I thought it was something that just wasn't for me. But in fact, I was being one of those, um, uh, <laughs> This is how I described one of my one of, one of Bubby's newish partners who were were not really loving right now. I said that he was like stuck up but dumb. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, was, I was doing that at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like I'm glad that I was able to get past that judgment and like my very light understanding of what it was to like actually see it in reality, get to experience it and also get yeah. to um, give my boyfriend the love he needs in the way that he needs it. I love that. So what was it about kink or SM when you first looked at it that made you say, no, that's not me? It was different. I come from a very conservative background and uh, although I'm, I'm very adventurous in general, I'm also very much like my mother in the mm. fact that I think that there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. And sometimes the right way is um, really just the way that's safest. Mm. And from what I, what I knew about BDSM, it was just so dangerous and dark and scary and mm. hurtful and nothing ever 
um, was sweet or nice about it and you couldn't relax and everything was so serious. Right. It, I just didn't know the reality of what being in a DS relationship was like until I actually got to experience it. Yeah. And would you say that those impressions came from media representations or kind of just cultural stereotypes or did you have interactions with kind of kinky communities that were unappealing or that didn't resonate with you? All of the above. Yeah. yeah. It, there, there are, when, when you looked, when I was younger, uh, the idea of BDSM was just um, dark leather clad people beating each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I got older, it became something that, you know, adults did and they were sort of, uh, I don't know how you would describe them. Maybe like, I think the people around me would describe them as freaky. Mm-hmm. They're sort of like, you know, into their sex and then that's what they do because they are freak type folk and Mm -hmm. I didn't consider myself to be one of them. Uh, Also in the times that I have uh, ventured out because while I was not uh, describing myself as kinky, I was never sort of like, oh, you shouldn't do that because it's scary or it's wrong or it's this or it's that. I was very into um, experiencing that sort of world and finding out why people did what they did and what they liked. Uh, right, right. But in the few times that I actually went and explored that, I often found a very unwelcome place, a very white um, mm. only place. Only place very, yeah. Very, uh, uh, like, like, I want to say even, I want to say even moderately abusive. Moderately place. abusive place. Yeah. And that just did and not just sit did well not. with me. Well. And I thought that. Yeah. And I thought that it was. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I actually, why I actually decided to go ahead and, and, go and ahead give it a try was because I would, said uh, she liked it. Like, and mm. I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I live by the, I, I grew up on Dan in Savage Love in my local <laughs> paper. So I'm, I'm so very much into the area of uh, being good, giving, and gain, as he puts it. Wherein, you yep. know, do what you do for your partner because you love them and it makes you them happy them. and that's basically it that's so cool. i i yeah. was nervous and i didn't know what i was doing what i was doing <laughs> i still i did a little bit of a try bit and then very quickly i found out that i was like oh Oh, wonderful. This is great. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice, 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 nice. It's so beautiful, right, when those compersive avenues are the entry point. Um, like, I was I was just giving a talk yesterday where folks were sort of like, how do people get into this? And I was like, yeah, you know, I think there's, like the, there's a couple of themes that you see a lot. And the one is this sort of like, this desire came up with me, right? Like as I became interested in things without having a name for it or like the labels or the like political identities, I knew that there were like kinky activities or things that were really like, you know, that made me feel kind of like tingly. But then I think a lot of folks come to kink because their partner wants it and they really love making their partner happy. And then in the course of getting to experience kink as a thing that makes your partner happy, you get to tap into it as something that can make you happy. So maybe it wasn't like your fetish or your kink or the way your desire was wired um, that seemed really apparent or evident to you. But when you start doing it, you realize, oh, this is, this is awesome. It's like, you know, this is a new food I haven't tried and now it's my favorite. I, you know what? I like, I like putting it that way. Um, cause I, 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 one of the things that my mother always did with me as a kid was if I, if I, if I immediately reacted to something like negative, she would, she would, I guess would say play devil's advocate and say, why don't you like that? Why don't you like that? Hmm. And she'd sort of make me think about it right in that moment. And sometimes she'd be like, oh, well, you know, I've never tried it either, but I'm going to try it right now. It's all right. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's a nice Ronald. Sort of taught me to do that myself. And I actually found when I was exploring uh, King of Buddhism that I, I, it is actually, it is actually one of my things. One of my things. Like, I didn't realize yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that great? Where you're like, oh, thank you. This is a whole room I wouldn't have gone into if I hadn't known here. It's like, you know, getting to find like a bonus wing on your house. Exactly. And it was it was more interesting because I always, I'm, I'm a person, um, my, when I went to college, my major was psychology. And I've always, mm-hmm. always attention to how people's brain works and how 
certain behaviors connect to another and how it sort of forms this larger idea of the things you like and don't like and how you process things in your brain. And I, I have learned through this period of doing this thing that sadism is something that I have enjoyed since I was a very little kid. Mm. I would, when I people would make me mad, mad, I would not, I would not hit them, hit, but I would hurt them in like a more psychological way. Mm. And it was payback for like, how dare you hurt me? But then after it was done, I'd be over with it. But I would enjoy my payback. Like I know there's, I don't get any, I don't get them being hurt. But I did know that I enjoyed watching them squirm. <laughs> And that, and that is like, I guess, <laughs> the, the basis of the, basis of, um, the way um, I, I, I explain my sadistic desires. Right. And as you've, as you've matured in your adult life, you've learned how to use it for good, not evil, right? And <laughs> learn how to use it. And he's like, now this is not going to become a vengeance-based tactic, but actually one that's about mutual pleasure, which is, you know, that, that's the secret, right? That's the thing that we want to see that progression with our sadism to like have it go into those really like mutual mutual ways exactly because now when i'm like oh i'm going to hurt you so bad it's really mm -hmm. like i'm going to pleasure you so good that's really what i yeah doing. right that's it it's exactly it well and it's yeah it's the thing i love about sadism and the thing i love about a masochist that is there to give my sadism a thing to do is that in my experience masochistic hunger is always far greater than capacity before and after play. And then during play, there's always a sort of like, oh, I couldn't possibly handle it. And that, you know, kind of that brink, that being right on the edge of a thing is of course really delicious. And it's such a gift. Like that's the thing I'm gives over is that, that kind of vulnerability and all of the ways, I mean, like, you know, if you think about it in terms of even like mirror neurons, I think watching someone in the throes of that kind of central nervous system excitement is exciting to me. Like it makes a ton of sense. I'd look at that and go, oh, yes, that makes me fire off as well. Um, but I also know that when I'm done, even if the person was just like, oh my God, that was as much as I've ever taken and, and it was excruciating and I was only doing it for you at the time, mistress, you know, within a couple of hours of that scene being completed, they're like already going to be fantasizing about all the ways they wish they'd taken more. And that's, that kind of loop is the thing I just find really, really delightful. Because you know that even if it's just sort of this like begging me to stop, you know, within fully the context of consent that um, is happening during a scene, before and after the scene, it'll always be like, oh, I wish I could take more, I wish I could take more. And I, I, that is one of the things that I find most, I guess you could say arousing, is I mm -hmm. like finding out how much he can mm -hmm. how much I can make him take before he's like, no, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, and of course, it changes from day to day. That's the other thing I really love is that um, masochism and sadism and any kind of desire isn't a static state. And it's highly dependent on you know, how our day is going, what are, what the other factors in our life um, are like. Um, I play with a lot of folks that experience you know, chronic pain or various um, levels of ability and disability that can shift and change. Uh, and how someone's body is feeling, someone's tendonitis is feeling, has everything to do with how they're gonna do in bondage and what's gonna be appealing to them. And that that fluidity is a part of what keeps things really fun. And I've definitely seen people be very disappointed in themselves that what they took one day couldn't be achieved, you know, the next time they played. And I think a part of the, the process is that you get that patience around, this isn't going to be the exact same thing every time because, you know, it's sort of a beautiful, beautiful snowflake. It's, it's sort of always going to be different. The constellation of factors will always be slightly different. Um, and that's what makes for really kind of connected and beautiful play. And what keeps that edge alive as well, I think. Yeah, I like that. It's, it's I have to say, in all the people that I've been talking to lately when, when it comes to BDSM and in this conversation today, I, I'm still trying to, I guess you could say formulate my, my feelings, my, the words, the way to express 
the sweetness of BDSM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it is just so so kind, no matter how it Mm -hmm. it looks. Yeah. There's so much much sacrifice that that both people have to undertake. There's so much much trust that needs to be there. And there's so much, so much, I, I, just care that's yeah. taking, yeah. that's to make, sure make sure that everything, that everything is okay is on both ends, and, both ends. and yeah. to allow and to for the, allow the, the, the wonderful sex that we're that, you know, having to actually occur. That's it. Well, it's intimacy, right? It's like intimacy and mutuality, and your stakes are really high. So there's a real reason. Like you can't. You can't be kind of, you know, I, there's no room for me to be lazy in a, in a sadomasochistic or a DNS exchange um, because I am as a top, as a, as, the, as a dominant, really being mindful, like my risk-aware consent, all the ways in which I want to make sure that this connection is going to happen in a way that fosters wellness and that is also protective of health, that that's all going on. And then, of course, you know, the submissive or bottom partner is like really actively and deeply engaged in all of that as well. And there are plenty of ways. I mean, like anyone can have any kind of sexual exchange in a way that isn't based on intimacy. Um, and it doesn't have to be non-consensual. It could still just be the sort of thing that's, you know, it's not appealing to me. It's objectifying. It's kind of narcissistically engaging. It's one-sided. Like, that isn't kink-specific. Any sex can look like that. Um, when I see that in kink, I'm particularly turned off by it. Um, and the kink that I love, and I, I love hearing you talk about it, is this um, deeply intimate pleasurable, I feel great about myself, I feel great about the person I'm playing with when it's done. And I do, and that's I, that's such a gift, right? It really, really is. I I I it's it's hard for me to sort of even put in words really because mm. I the way I've experienced it so far is just the feeling. And they've been so I guess you could say new. Yeah. That I'm still that just I'm processing just them processing and them. letting them like roll over me as a wave and seeing what they are and how they act. How they act. Yeah. It's. It's. Hmm. Yeah. Because even well, right, it's, I'm right now, go ahead. I'm I'm sitting here and I, and we're having this discussion and my boy and sub is sitting here laying down asleep snoring and I'm like oh mm. that's like, oh, so sweet I can't wait for him to get up because I really really just need to like need to like spank him or something Mm -hmm. (laughs) right yeah and it's so i don't know i don't know i know i it's sweet and i know for myself i experience things like spanking or flogging or bondage as you know intense touch like the the part of me that understands what it's like to hug or caress um or be physically close to someone that sense of intimacy goes into, you know, bondage is a really tight hug. <laughs> um, like there's a, a way in which like spanking is about being able to put my hands on someone very, very deeply and very rhythmically. And it feels great. Like I'm, I'm sitting here like, you know, making little fists <laughs> with my hands as I talk about this because it's like, oh yes, it's like, you know, completely delicious and delightful. And often when I'm talking with like couples that'll come in that are kind of kink discordant couples where one person's really interested in kink and the other person's like, oh, I don't think I'm so interested in this because of all the things you had mentioned, right? Because this seems like kind of violent or dirty or abusive or unappealing to me. Um, The first order of business is to get on a kind of common plane and to break out of the stereotypic two-dimensional notions of what this involves and find the more common planes where we all know about styles of physical connection or physical intimacy that are going to be deeply pleasurable. And everyone's got a reference point for that. I was, I was again, giving this talk yesterday where I was talking about how a hickey is a sadomasochistic act. It, it leaves marks. It's actually kind of edge play if you think about it. Most of my scenes, I don't actually get to leave marks. Someone's got like, you know, kind of concerns in their life that means the marks wouldn't work. Um, 
but that the you know giving someone a hickey is sort of a rite of passage um most teenagers do it at some point it's a part of you know it's a part of sex or a huge number of folks that would consider themselves vanilla but we can understand why it feels really great to kind of chomp down on somebody like that yeah and i honestly I, one of the things i've been uh other things i've been very focusing on in sort of my head and getting my my thoughts together on uh, for future projects, I guess, is just the idea of how DS is sort of not a thing that is rare or different from what everyone does. It's just about words and judgment and ideas of how we think things go versus how they really go. Well, and of making things explicit, right? Which I, I often think about the difference between, I mean, they, I think there's a huge difference between identity and behavior. And this is what trips people up, right? That folks feel like in order to be able to enjoy a behavior, they have to claim the identity. And there are plenty of people that, you know, identify as gay or lesbian who really enjoy having sex with like, you know, sort of folks that are a different gender than they are, um, but don't really want to like have that mean that they give up their gay or lesbian identity that like it's to happen plenty of monogamously identified people bring thirds into their relationship or bring other folks into a relationship for like sexual play they don't have to give up the identity of being monogamous you can keep that identity and you can enjoy behaviors that don't necessarily conform with that identity we don't police that um and i think cultivating that kind of safety and abundance often lets folks experiment and step into things and sometimes the identity does follow suit sometimes folks are able to say actually i do like this behavior i'm kind of ready to take on the mantle of being a kinky person i'm ready to fly that flag but other times it's like no i'm, I'm pretty vanilla but i do you know totally like tying my partner up because they love it and just having the permission to have that kind of diversity i think is huge i know for me dns like the dominance and submission stuff is critically important because i spend you know a huge amount of my non kinky time and actually, you know, a huge amount of my kinky time thinking about power dynamics and about um, the way that power and justice work in the world. And so they're not casual or even intellectual topics for me. They have deep implications for my community members, my family of choice. Um, and that stuff, I'm engaging that really conscientiously. Um, and it's one of the things, again, I love about my kink community is that we tend in, you know, communities, right? Like there's so much broadness here. This is not a monolith, right. but among folks, I just finished a, a um, training intensive with a group of doms in my space. And as it turned out, a significant number of the women involved in the training also were very engaged in like doing social justice work in community. And it was kind of beautiful because we were able to bring that work that we do in our communities to the work we do in our kink. Um, I love that purposeful articulation and that kind of thoughtfulness through it. Um, and the way in which actually when we are labeling our power exchange or our DNS relationships or our power discordant relationships, we're engaged in a level of egalitarianism, kind of ironically, that's I think a lot higher than folks that are just kind of like, doing their relationship thing, but not necessarily like with a lot of mindfulness or examination. Because what it means to say, I'm going to give myself over to you, you're going to own me, I'm going to be owned, um, is in, an exceptionally full state. Exceptionally full. Sort of yeah, there's just, a, there's a lot of detail there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of meaning and that meaning is going to be different for different people. And it's going to be different within different contexts and different relationships. Um, right. And so like, I, I love the way that we get to be just engaged and mindful in that. And that not in a, like, there's a right or wrong way to do it, but that what we are doing that might be different than kind of like Joe Schmo vanilla person who's not getting to really do a lot of introspection into what they love and why they do it is have some intentionality behind it. You know, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent I'm of big people proponent just doing things without labels. Without labels. Um, mm -hmm. Coming from uh, the background of, of growing up in a, in a mostly African American sort of uh, culture, culture, there's this, there's this 
way where people just sort of live their life and they do the things they do and they do the things they love and they don't really talk about it or share about it with anyone and at the same time they'll often be really hesitant to identify with the the label that mainstream society is put on that group yeah uh, for example, uh, there, there are lots of people who are transgender. There are lots of people who are uh, queer, bisexual, pansexual, whatever. But, but they don't they bother, to bother to get the politics of it. Politics of it. Yeah. They're focused on living their lives in a way that's best for them. Yeah. So if, if, so if that's if, what if people want to do, I mean, that, that to me, that's that to me that because... Yeah. Um, I honestly don't I honestly think don't need think the labels. I don't think you need all the words to describe the thing in order to just do it and also have that emotion and experience the emotion and love what you're doing. Yeah, I agree with that so much. I mean, if the identity is comforting to you, if it, if it gives you something, that's great. Like I'm all for folks taking on identity labels if it's something that feels constructive and empowering. And I really resonate with and agree with this notion that some of those labels also, there's good reasons why folks wouldn't step toward them, right? Like the rainbow flag, and like I live near the Castro in San Francisco. Um, what it means to be part of mainstream gay culture in San Francisco is to be really, um, you know, embattling a lot of kind of white supremacy and like deep, ugly misogyny and race. There's a lot, there's a lot, lot in that community gonna embrace that like yes i'm saying gender loving no that flag doesn't really fly for me um right like identity and behavior they get to be separate things and they get to be fully and completely self-determined and but and you know it's i i I feel that and then at the same time i have this other other side of me that's sort of trying to figure out what's with the reluctance what's with the reluctance to put up the labels Mm-hmm. Or, or to find ways that are easier for people to understand. Right. Because I, I, I know that I'm like a gay man. Uh, I, I, I call myself an atheist, but I'm really more of a humanist. Um, mm-hmm. um, uh, I, even like gay for me, like I, I mostly have sex with men, and the vast majority of the people I have sex with are men, but I'm, I'm open to right. having sex with um, let's say cis men, let's say cis, cis, women. cis women, but then I've recently then I've been working on, you know, my issues surrounding attraction to people who are non-binary or people who are right. uh, trans and, and they don't have the genitals that are traditionally associated with representation. Right. So it's hard so for it's hard me to find a label that really, you know what, I think I just solved you know, my own question. <laughs> See, I'm I'm glad to help. I'm just gonna sit here and you know, because <laughs> I, I was about to say it's hard for me to find a label that I feel like truly encompasses who I am and what I do and what I believe. So I just choose like the closest, the next best thing. But yeah, you don't have to choose the next best thing. You don't have to choose anything at all. That's it. You know, and you can hold them lightly. You can hold what you choose lightly, and it gets to change and shift over time. You know, this is part of the binary culture we live in, is that you need to pick one. It's a zero-sum game. You can't have membership in one category without disavowing your membership in the other, and you have to sign on for life. And that's just all, you know, horseshit. <laughs> like, none of that actually reflects the way that human lives are lived and that we're not living as these, like, isolated individuals in vacuums, despite what Western culture wants to tell us, that we're, like, communal creatures and we're living in multi-generational like, you know, sort of enclaves. Um, And so those things get to be, I mean, label is one way of putting it. My reframe might be that I'm always striving for self-definition. So what the, the phrase or terms that you use get to generate from you, maybe they have stuff in common with someone else. Maybe there's utility in language, right? For expedience sake, it's nice to say we're both tops. We kind of know what we mean by that. Yeah. Um, and what it means for me to be a top and for you to be a top will have some built-in difference. And we kind of know that comes along with the territory. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes for fun conversations. Yeah. Um, well, I, but actually, yeah, there's a, such a pressure to be so rigid and to grab onto a thing. And, and I understand, too, why some folks are like, yeah, I don't, I don't like that community. That community doesn't reflect me. I'm not supported by it. There's, like, microaggressions or oppressions within that community I don't want to, like, subject myself to. That's all real. I feel like that's – I also like to want to 
I want to create real space for oh, self care yeah. to happen in that. Because being 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 a, a a gay man in you know what's what tends to be a very uh, white dominated media space, I'll say. Yeah, yeah. It's very difficult for me uh, because I I know that you know Neil Patrick Harris, who's constantly the poster boy for you know moderate gay America, is supposed to be supposed to be whatever. But I just I just don't identify with him and I also don't like um him being the face of it but I, I I'm still gay yeah I just I don't know it's it's hard yeah. for me to want to be a part of a group that feels like that it that makes it feel like I'm not there yeah yeah hugely right it's real it's real and it's I think a lot of folks right there's like these I think systemic ways that people across um, communities are engaged in that process, like are being marginalized. Um, and then I think there are the like individual ways people can resonate with that where they don't feel mirrored or seen. I mean, it's, it's what makes even the word community so sort of challenging because we're really talking about like so many different like micro communities and so many different like small gatherings of like-minded people who come together to support each other and feel inspired. But that might not be like, you know, if you and I visit any city in America, we might not be able to just drop into the first SM party that we see online and be like, yes, my people, <laughs> right? It'll probably be another couple levels of, of discerning stuff from there. Um, even the way like queer women and queer men's spaces work um are so so very different and i know for myself being a queer woman who's heavily allied with trans communities um it's really challenging in women's communities which can be cis women's communities can be so so transphobic and awful toward our trans sisters and um and that limits the communities that i get to engage with right because i'm not engaging in cis women's communities that don't include trans women as women as I absolutely should. Right? And so, like, we're all, and, and that's where suddenly it's like, oh, I was really going to, like, not be into this labeling thing, except there's this way in which it has, like, practical application and reality, and now i got to listen to it. And, and then at the end of all of that, I just want to have, like, all my best girlfriends come over and, you know, play with the new bondage chair. <laughs> like, this is why we need to, like, you know, just have fun and go and spank our kids, spank our boys, <laughs> because it's like, ah, now I just want to go have some fun. This is, this, is, this is a hard project, this being in the world with integrity. <laughs> You know, I honestly, I think, like we're talking about the word label, mm -hmm. and I was, I was trying to figure out why I don't like that word. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it might be because it doesn't exactly get to the idea of what I'm looking for when I pick a label, mm -hmm. or when I pick a uh, identifier. Really, really, what I'm trying to do trying is to that I'm just trying to, trying to make a make easy a note of the experiences of the I've had in my life and the type of ideas and beliefs I have. And I, I, I think I, I, better, I think better way to put that way to put that would be like my tribe, my, my family. Mm. family. Mm. I, I, I talk to uh, Bubby talk about to that a lot because his family is very shitty, racist, classist, sexist, transphobic, Fox mm -hmm. News loving, um, Obama hating Ooh. people. So they are definitely not a part of his life. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but he, he has always yearned to be a part of something, a part of a family that yeah. loved him unconditionally. And for me, I didn't always like my family so much. Like, I know they love me, but I'm, but I'm just different. Right. Um, so I, I, ever since I was a kid, I've always had this drive to sort of create my own tribe. Yeah. And throughout my life, I've collected friends and I've collected um, coworkers and people who, who are of my same ilk, and they are just a part of my life. And... Recently with Bubby, that's sort of become where he's at now. He's just a part of my life. 
um, we share we share a lot of similar beliefs, a lot of similar feelings, and that mm. I, I guess like maybe what we should be doing is having a name for your tribe. I don't know. <laughs> but it's one of those things too, right? Like maybe you don't have a name for it, but you know it when you're in it. You know it when you feel it. Um, and yeah, sometimes we name a thing for expediency or so that we can kind of like clock each other and know sort of where we're at. Or, you know, honestly, I think a lot of the labeling comes out of just like, I want to have a good date. And so if I'm going to list a bunch of things I'm looking for, <laughs> like, this is like just the early litmus. Like, I, I want this, 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 and this. That's going to be a list. And there's going to be some like, some identifiers on that. And it's going to help get folks in the door. But um you know, I do think this notion of like family and tribe and just like that safety, that safe space is so critical. Um, I think that, I don't know, I personally feel like there's a way in which queer communities, we, we've been set up to foster this for ourselves in a way that I'm very grateful for. Yes. Um, and it's out of necessity, right? Like it's often out of a kind of trauma or a, a deeply like exclusionary or oppressive experience. But it's also this like, beautiful survival skill that's really created so much happiness in my life. Um, and often when I'm working with straight identified folks who are really just living in straight community, I'm having to remember that the resources might be a little bit different. And a lot of the relationship patterns that I'm suggesting are not um, native to their communities. Which is uh, Yeah, yeah. Because I will but say, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to bring a little gay to the to the straight mainstream. I'm like, let me show you how my people do it because we we're onto something. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was uh, yeah, like I I find my straight friends and I'll I'll be helping them with you know their issues because I'm the sex guy, and they'll tell me things that I'm just like, I I I why is this even a problem? Because <laughs> I I just yeah. don't I don't I I, I forget I from time to time that. Because, because they've never been forced never been to really figure out where they place in the world, oftentimes mm. just sort of doing. Yeah, yeah. And that can be really and problematic for really trying problematic to live, a, trying to live a, I guess, the best life you possibly can. Yeah. If, if yeah. you're and outside your office alone. I mean, it's, I find it invaluable when I'm working with folks around kink, right? Because there's a way in which a lot of what I've learned how to do, I, I, I learned by necessity when I was like 13, 14, 15 years old. And then I've had a lot of time to practice it, which is, you know, great. Um, and then I'll work with folks who might be in their like 40s or 50s, right? Like we're grown ass people now. And suddenly it's like, oh my God, I have to learn a skill set that I don't have and I'm having to learn it as an adult. It's actually this really nice inversion because I often think about the skills that we get as queer folks and I'm using queer as this really broad umbrella. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's all these kind of like survival skills that we get that I think are just incredibly adaptive and and filled with so much resilience and I'm really just like proud of. But there's these other ways where I missed so many developmental milestones because, you know, I never dated boys. Like, I did not go through a phase of being like, well, I'm going to just like go through the the stages here. Like, I was a bossy girl who liked other girls from like the time I was teeny tiny. And that has been consistent through my life. Um, and so I learned how to date, you know, kind of properly in the way that I didn't have to like, you know, kind of <laughs> coerce girls to, you know, make out with me in like funny areas of their parents' house. But I, I learned how to date properly, you know, like 10 years later than my straight co counterparts because I didn't come of age at a time when you could be out and gay in high school or junior high. And so all the things that like straight people get to do and do poorly when you're 12, 13, 14, right? These are disastrous years because they're set up to be. Developmentally, you should be like, you know, kind of a big dork during this period of time. I got to be that big dork in my 20s. Most queer folks, we get to do those things. We get to learn how to have those relationships later in life. We get to have our teenage drama often when we're adults and it's, you know, not so pretty. Um, so it's, it's kind of a give and take <laughs> where I'm often like, yeah, there's a bunch of these things I did much later in life and than I would have if I'd gotten to just come up a kind of traditional straight girl and cross all those bridges at the time that's more average or typical. And then there are all these ways that I have very creative workarounds for stuff 
that I have been, I've had down for, you know, like 25 years because I've gotten to practice them for a very long time that I can share with my, with my um, straight counterparts who are really struggling with how do I work with non-monogamy or outsourcing or, you know, this like chasm between my behavior and my identity. And I, I feel and like, I feel like, not like not, I, I know that I know in some ways we have it, we have it, I guess, I guess better because better we're supposed to be a bit more mindful. mindful. But I feel like without feel both like of them together, together and us, and us like the the, 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 the two uh, camps uh, of development, development, working together working and sort of sharing together, our experiences back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. things wouldn't work things as well. Mm. Because although, although you know there's lots there's of things lots when it comes to like sex and life and, and choosing things that that straight people just don't just learn, learn, there are things that we don't learn, learn. and there are things mm -hmm. that I don't that I, myself like just myself when it comes to straight, straight up dating or how to flirt or how to do things like that, I wasn't a part of that because I was one of three gay kids in my school and there was no need to exactly. flirt because we were all horny boys and we're teenagers so we're going to go ahead and just do that. Yeah, like we just found each other. <laughs> we found each other in a little pod. <laughs> so like there was no need to learn any of that stuff but I'm having to learn it now as an adult and I feel like right. I'm learning like I'm a lot, a lot just from listening to my straight friends who have been doing it a while mm -hmm. more than i probably could have learned if i did it as a teenager and that, that's actually for yeah. me actually better. Better. Yeah. yeah yeah but we are getting but towards are like towards the time where you need to go so i realized we just started talking and we've been talking for like an hour and you never <laughs> introduced your so before we <laughs> <laughs> I'll give my little introduction. Hi, I'm Morgana May. I am a 20-year veteran, professional, dominant, um, doctoral level kinky lady um, based in San Francisco who uh, appreciates having these kinds of deep and varied conversations about sex and kink. And where can people find your stuff? They can find my stuff at www.mistressmorgana.com or at www.loveyourkink.com. Cool. And you can um, follow me on Twitter at Morgana May. Morgana May. All right. Um, I have um, to say, I really, really like the conversation today. It's it ended up going places that I, like I had a couple of topics that I wanted to talk about that we didn't actually get to. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess that that's just sort of the beauty of how this show works is you just sort of talk, and then life goes on, and life is great, and you have great conversations, and you meet cool people. I love it. Well, I love you, Jerome, and I love your podcast. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It was really, really very fun to get to have the conversation. I, I agree. It was really very fun to have you on. Um, we'll have to have you back on sometime in the future. Uh, but I guess that's it for us today. We're going to end the episode here and have a great day, everybody. Thanks so much.